Yeah. Hello, everyone. Daniel here with Gabriel. Good evening. Um, this is exciting. It's a little live stream. Hopefully, folks enjoy uh, our conversation this evening. So here we are. Um, you know, a few, gosh, what was it? Uh, I, I, I have no sense of time anymore, but we held an incredible event on Desire of Psychoanalysis, which is a book that Gabriel wrote, published by Northwestern, called the Diuresis Series, edited by Chizek, McGowan, and Johnston. And there's a new book called um, The Search for Clarity, um, uh, Science and Philosophy in Lacan's Oeuvre. <laughs> I love that word. Ugh. Uh, so we can we can just, uh, you know, reference what the hell he's using this. He actually opens the book with a very fascinating historical breakdown on uh, what an of was and what in modernity, how it has shifted. Um, so we, we will definitely address that. But tonight we want to take your questions. Feel free to chat anything. Um, Gabriel's read quite a lot more in some of the interlocutors that Milner works with in the history of science and French science of epistemology uh, than I have read. So I will be um, saying things that strike me and also raising questions. And so this is an open, this is an open study session. Um, and I think the first thing to note here, Gabriel, is that Milner himself is a fascinating figure. You know, he's he's of the exact same generation of Bajou. Um, he is drawn to Lacan as a young Maoist militant like Ranciere and many of the other figures that we study quite a lot. Um, yet he makes a pretty stark pivot from radical politics and militancy and takes on what you might call a kind of anti-capitalist pro-liberal position. Um, and I only recognize that in his um very interesting book that i've read on harry potter um <laughs> yeah because uh he's very frustrating to read politically he says beautiful things on anti-semitism he's known as one of the foremost experts on anti-semitism but politically he is makes me want to pull my hair out because he has a deep understanding of the marxist orientation but he has abandoned all of its core tenants, commitments, etc. Um, uh, uh, yet retained its robust critique of capital, right? Um, and at the same time, seems to not necessarily be an apologist for neoliberalism. He's not a kind of reactionary slaughter dyke type figure. I wouldn't go that far. But maybe it's fair to say his politics are a bit ambiguous. Um, I don't know if you what you think of them. Um, but he certainly seems to have some um, liberal realist commitments, I would characterize them. Um, and that just well, doesn't what does that mean, just so I understand what you mean by that. He seems to me to basically be somebody who um, uh, champions some of the core tenets of the liberal uh, political tradition um, and sees them as necessary uh, modes not to necessarily be overcome, but to be further entrenched and further uh, enhanced, further developed. Um, so, you know, he is not thinking that a strong break with liberalism is necessary, it, it, as far as I read him, um, which I think is a hallmark of his anti-Marxism, if we could say that. But again, to yeah. even call him an anti-Marxist may be yeah. too strong. Uh, because I mean, we, we've been talking for like two minutes and you already called the guy anti-Marxist. <laughs> probably too strong it's probably too strong um anyways but i know we're not here to talk about his politics although in a curious way politics do come up uh, mm -hmm. as we'll discuss later um but there, there there is not much published in english on his work he is in a, another interesting reason that he should be studied and more work should be published by him it's because you know we have this classic Lacan Chomsky debate, which is transposed to Zizek Chomsky debate. Well, it turns out that Milner was a disciple of Chomsky. I mean, studied at MIT for many years and was probably the only figure that really tried in a crazy way to fuse Lacan with Chomsky in a way, right? To fuse kind of French 
approaches Galilean approaches to science um, in that very unique way that he's trained in with the Chomsky and generative linguistic model, right? And moving away from Chomsky's biological foundation in it. Um, I'm no expert on Chomskyism, but I find that interesting. Um, I don't know uh, about you. And also, of course, and I'll, I'll stop here, Milner um, remains committed to the um, correctness of Lacan, I would say, or to the um, overall success of the Lacanian project, even today, um, which is interesting because we'll talk about this at the end of the, uh, the book we're going to talk about tonight. You know, he basically says that um, the disillusion, the, the final period of Lacan's thought kind of uh, represented almost like a um, deterioration in some sense. Something became unfinished. And then he makes this point that, well, something is only unfinished to the extent that that thing no longer can think or produce thought. And of course, producing thought is something we can define because for Milner, that means something very specific. And he says that um, Jacqueline Miller's school has in fact produced thought out of the late Lacan. Mm -hmm. So anyways, so why do you think this book is important? Why is it worth us getting together on a Thursday night to... to yeah, decide? I mean, I think that, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm really kind of impressed that Milner hasn't really been more translated into English because he's a very singular person, very singular author in terms of people presenting Lacan, discussing consequences of Lacanian ideas in other fields, because both because of his style, which I think in this particular case, we should go into more, in more depth because his style and his method are very closely related. Um, so both because of his style and also because of the sort of rigor of his intervention. So uh, just to name a few of the books that we're missing out in English. So uh, there is a book on the history of pleasure called The Triplet of Pleasure, which is an amazing short book discussing the, the noddings and unnoddings of uh, eroticism, sexuality, and love from the Greek world through the Middle Ages to the modern period of Lacanic Freud. There is a book that, for me, was highly influential, and I know that, uh, for example, Zizek definitely read it, which is called The Wages of the Ideal, which is an interpret... It's a reading, a sort of analysis of the uh, conjuncture of French society, especially of the intellectual middle class after the 80s. And he proposes a new concept of how to deal with the concept of wage labor and a very polemical thesis that you can have a sort of wage, uh, what he calls the salar salary bourgeoisie, right? The, the people who are uh, bourgeois, but they are paying wages and how, but with a specific kind of structure. So it's a very interesting uh, intervention also on the side of economics. Uh, well, I, the Harry Potter book, I can't really vouch for. I haven't read it and I find it a bit weird. Uh, though if you look at Milner, perhaps you could imagine him in a Harry Potter movie. Uh, you're, getting a, you're getting a slight echo uh, on the stream, apparently. So I don't know what to do. Perhaps try me, unplugging try and see if that works. Let's see. Echo cancellation. Any chance this is better? Yeah, they might. They might let us know. Um, F's mentioned that. I know, I think I know who F says. Yes. So let me know if, if it's better. But well, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I hear you. Perfect. Yeah, I don't know what's up. I think it should be fine. Uh, let's just continue. Yeah, yeah. So this. So yeah. So I mean, there's this book on pleasure, the book on on, on wage theory, uh, in the Harry Potter thing. I mean, there are books on linguistics and the relation between language and psychoanalysis. Yeah. And there is this book, which, in my opinion, it's actually uh, a really interesting kind of. If you're interested in your nurse approach to Lacan, I think this is a kind of companion piece to the search for clarity, 
um, yeah. which is called Indistinct Names. It's a previous book. It was written in the 80s. Uh, and uh, it was kind of prompted by a seminar that, I mean, the way that he tells the story, if I'm not mistaken, is that it's kind of prompted by a, a development of a presentation he did in Lacan seminar that Lacan praised a lot. Yeah. Kind of further developed it and wrote a very, very interesting, very different book mm -hmm. where I think that some of his political commitments or his, his, his political position is a bit easier to read, especially if you read the last chapter of that book, in this mm -hmm. evening, which mm -hmm. is called like, a generation that uh, wasted itself, like that didn't live up to something, right? Yeah. And he pretty much gives an analysis of what happened to his generation. Uh, why did these people who were working kind of in the same environment, bringing together politics, psychoanalysis, why did this get dispersed? And that word is very relevant in that book because dispersion, I mean, it actually reappears in this book, both books and uh, with the idea of dispersion. So one is dispersion, the other is dissolution, right? Uh, but there's a very interesting kind of uh, similarity in the, the two books. Mm -hmm. uh, both of them try to start from first principles uh, to, to develop a sort of theory of, that starts from psychoanalysis, but by the end of it, you realize there was very little on psychoanalysis in the book, which I think is the case in this book and the previous one. And both end with a discussion of collectivity and dispersion as a sort of limit point. Mm -hmm. The first case is perhaps more telling because the discussion is political. Uh, we can get to it at some point. I have I translated informally parts of that book because I was so in love with it mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. I wanted everyone to read it. And uh, Ed Pluff, who translated uh, In Search of Clarity, actually, we worked together on this translation a bit. We proposed to translate indistinct names before In Search of Clarity, but uh, but the second book is uh, a bit more famous, perhaps, and a bit more well-established show, so it seemed like the better option to go. That's why I think we went forward with its translation. Yeah. Okay. That's very helpful background. Um, I think we should jump into the book itself. So again, this is published at the Diaresis Press, Northwestern University Press, in English by Ed Pluth was a good guy. We met him at the LAC conference um, that Todd McGowan hosts. Uh, and so he's really sweet guy. He's done a lot of great translations. Um, it's short. It's only like, I want to say 145 pages. Um, it is precisely as the title suggests. I mean, you're going to walk away kind of like reading Freud. You walk away, wait, this was so clear that I need to read it again because something, it's like, the opposite of um, of Lacan's style, in a way. And he opens the book by saying that really the, the way to read Lacan is through the distinction between esoteric and exoteric, right? And the, the, um, the surprise, surprise, the esoteric is actually found in the seminars. It's found in what he calls the oral Lacan. And in the end of the book, Milner says that the oral Lacan actually could be um, hypothetically formalized in the same way that he has formalized um, the exo, e exo, exoteric Lacan, which is found in the Acre, right? So in, or, or not only the Acre, but found in, in everything that Lacan wrote. And so the book proceeds on the presupposition that everything Lacan wrote retains um, the status both of an oeuvre, of a kind of um, master project, which in a way is um, untimely to itself, precisely because, and he references Foucault very early, by saying that one of the marking points of a society encroached by madness is a society in which an author or authors no longer possess the capacity to have oeuvres or to have master works, right? And that Lacan is in that sense, a kind of rare master, right? And so that's a little bit of background on, on that. And then the other thing that's quite nice, Gabriel, is, um, well, maybe this, I'll form this in the form of a question to you. Um, Milner wants to say that there's really three 
sections of Lacan's thought in total, chrono chronologically. The first classicism, the second classicism, and the dissolution. And each of these classicisms is um, held together by a certain relationship to science. And very early on, it is established that the usually we talk about de Saussure, structural linguistics, um, and of course, that's very central for Lacan, obviously, in the very composition of um, the subject and the signifier, which we'll talk about. But beyond Saussure, it is Coiré who is the interlocutor, the master. And I want to actually invite you to say a little bit more about this very important Alexander uh, Coyer, to be anglicized, it's Coyer, um, although that's probably not appropriate. It's Kojev on the one hand and Coiré on the second hand as the two figures that establish Lacan's epistemology of science both in different ways. Um, Coyer is more significant. Can you sp explain who this guy is and why he's so central for both Lacan, but also, you know, for the tradition of French epistemology of science? Yeah, I mean, just to, I think to go into this topic, we need to step back a bit because you discuss, you mentioned like this. I mean, we don't need to use the French word, but we can just say work, right? A work we know what work of art means like the, that particular meaning of work right uh, so you mentioned the uh milner's decision which is like one of the founding kind of uh decisions of this book which is to say look i'm gonna restrain myself to analyzing what lacan wrote not what lacan said but why does he need to make that choice like why did he make that choice to begin with right and well, he says that he's looking for the part of Lacan's teaching that best fits the idea of work. But then the question is, why is he looking for the idea of work? Why is this important? And, well, it's funny because the theme of the work, again, it's in this previous book, Indistinct Names, it's already there. When he makes a presentation on In Search of Clarity uh, in Badiou Seminar in the same year, and he is making a short summary of the book. He spends like 10 minutes on this idea. And you can see that work is, let's say, the stand-in for totality in a certain sense. Like a work is something that is contained in itself, right? You will find the reasons, you will find the motivations, you will find the order of construction of arguments kind of self-enclosed in a work, in a position, for example, to a text that might refer to something which is not in that text, it's in another text which is uh, not contained there. He gives a lot of this, the, the kind of specifications of what a work is, the history of work. He, he clearly uh, is interested in Foucault's kind of genealogy of this category. But the reason why I'm saying this is because there's a really beautiful statement in uh, in his interview, kind of his presentation for with Alain Badiou. Just see if I can find it here. I might, might not be able to, but uh if i do it's it's quite interesting he says uh, uh where is it blah, blah, blah. i will get to quite just just wait if this quote helps uh it's in this book here. Yes. So this is the quote. Let me just share it with you guys so you can read it together with us. Uh, here we go. So this is se session nine of Badiou's seminar on Lacan. He invited Milner to talk about In Search of Clarity. And while Milner is talking about, he says this, so I think it it will bring the connection between French epistemology Poirier on one side and the idea of work on the other. He says, uh, uh, Freud chose the work form rather than the monograph form, which is used in academic science. However, modern science is opposed to modern culture in that the former is indifferent to the work form, right? Science is indifferent to the form of 
a closed work, while the latter has made its made the work its foundation. So culture would be made up of works, the sort of fragments of discourse, fragments of whatever you want to call it, that kind of are able to stand on their own beyond the, the life of the, its authors and its thinkers, right? That would be, let's say, what culture is made of. So Freud wanted to make a name for himself in science, but he failed. And he decided strategically to accept, to make a detour to culture. So, and, and he, he says something similar, what kind of came up against a similar deafness on the part of the institution of psychoanalysts, right? He made a detour to the world of culture. That's why he talks about when you publish, publish a work, you're publishing it into culture and culture is not science. Right. So in that sense, you are kind of, throwing it in the garbage, right? Yeah. So that's that's a Milner interpretation of what, first, why this kind of a dual of culture and science is relevant, why he needs to find something that is kind of self-standing uh, in Lacan, so a work, so that he can analyze, analyze it imminently and not trust some personal intervention, right? He mentions this more than once at the beginning of the book, that he's trying to make this book not about his thinking, but about Lacan's thinking. Mm -hmm. He wants to prove that there is thought in Lacan, which I think is yeah. a very subtle idea, in fact. So two things happen at the point. On the one hand, he wants to, he needs to find the, the proper ground to, to show us that there is mm -hmm. thought, and therefore to find the correct ground to show that there is thought in an author, which is not my own thought, you should look for works because mm. that's where you have self-enclosed kind of cultural objects, right? But on the other hand, he wants to extract from those cultural objects something which he calls a thinking. And a thinking is something that needs to survive its own context. That's one of his definitions of thinking, right? Yeah. I, he, he has like, the, he's an amazing kind of craft, craft, yeah. craft you know, of sentences, right? That definition of thinking as thinking that is something which imposes itself, something whose existence imposes itself on those who haven't thought it, right? Mm -hmm. So it impl implies some displacement, some kind of, you can shift the context, you can vary the ambience, but something preserves. Yeah. And he connects this to some sort of impersonal dimension. So uh, that idea, I think, prepares the ground for the idea that, uh, that you almost need to find the sort of, if you're going to find something invariant, something impersonal inside a work, you're looking for that thing, which is, let's say, in relation to science, right? In the case of psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. in the work. As he said, mm -hmm. psychoanalysis has cultural products because of, as, as a cop-out, because of an obstacle. That's not what Freud nor Lacan wanted. They had to intervene at the cultural level because, yeah. or to leave us cultural kind of fragments because that's what they could do, right? Yeah. They're looking at something else. So I think that that's the entry point to understand why this guy is going to now speak about science and mathematics and the relation that Lacan had with those things for a hundred pages. Mm -hmm. uh, why I think that this is relevant because the reference to Quahé, to Kojève, I mean, People are more used to the idea that Lacan was really into Kojev. Like he quotes Kojev often. When Kojev dies, he mentions it, blah, blah, blah. But Quahé is not, I mean, you can find references to Quahé in seminar two, seminar four. Right. Uh, but not that often. I mean, it's not like he's a major interlocutor, right? Right. Uh, so why is Milner emphasizing that? <clears throat> Gabriel froze. <laughs> Hopefully really? he comes back. Uh, yeah, you froze for a second. Do you have audio? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Okay, you're good. Yeah, yeah, you're good now. Go ahead. Yeah, no, so that's so just to kind of put the enigma up in the air, like why yeah. did Milner choose to having that question, having that project? I want to show, uh, demonstrate. Talks about proofs that there yeah. is thinking in Lacan. So why, with that kind of mission in mind? Are you going to emphasize Lacan's relation 
to a historian of physics, a historian right. of Galileo and Newton. So there's a bit of Milner's, Milner's emphasis there. I don't think it's like yeah. something that anyone by reading Lacan would come up with and say, this guy is essential. Well, no, I mean, he, that's true, but he does provide um, references to, to underscore his argument. Um, but with Lacan, it's always hard to find an isolated statement where he may say, Coye is our master at one isolate. It doesn't yeah. quite translate as, as um, but let, let us move to understand um, why Coye is so central for understanding Lacan's project. And it really revolves around what Milner calls the core doctrine of science on the one hand, which is a um, specific kind of um, choice around a conception of the mathematized notion of the universe. Like it has some specific um, axioms and principles associated with it. Could you help us kind of yeah. break, break some of these things down? I mean, there's something interesting to mention there because Milner constructs the sort of triad that goes from Poiré with some general propositions, Kojève with what he calls a lemma or like an additional kind of corollary to what Poiré said. And then Lacan comes with, between Freud and Lacan, some added statement is made to that. And this would be a sort of cohesive understanding of science, right? That Milner is claiming not to be his own, but Lacan's own. Mm -hmm. So I think Poiré, it's important to know this, that Poiré is a kind of failed student of Russell, he studied with Russell and with uh, Hilbert, very famous mathematician connected to the formalist school, actually the kind of founder of it. Uh, by formalist school in mathematics, it's that kind of the thing everyone mentions before they say that it failed. Like those guys who thought mathematics could be reduced to a syntactical game where you don't need to know the meaning of the terms, but just the rules of the game, you can extract all mathematical propositions. And then Godel show that that's not possible. Yeah, that's the vulgar understanding of what Hubert wanted. Hubert was like an amazing mathematician. He contributed amazingly to science, and he had that kind of philosophy of mathematics, which is definitely not the core of of his project. But anyway, he studied with Hilbert and Russell. Russell didn't like his work very much. Uh, they would meet later on again and. Actually, he would influence Russell back, apparently. But he started as a, a philosopher of religion, not of science. And that's kind of interesting because, I mean, Poiré writes amazingly well. It's, his books are beautiful, in my opinion. Uh, he has a book called Discovering Plato, which mm. I think is key to understand his position because one of his main theses is that there is a weird continuity or repetition of Plato in Galileo. Yeah. Right? Uh, if you were to simplify a bit his kind of approach, you would say that uh, he's trying to turn Galileo into uh, somebody whose main kind of contribution or, or the, the, the thing that truly made a difference is the new use of mathematics in physics rather than a sort of experimental approach of any, any kind, right? It's a sort of an epistemology, very rationalist epistemology, which amplifies the value of a certain break with the empirical. That's why it's yeah. Yeah. It's, not, it's not from the sensible that you'll ever extract a scientific proposition. There is a break. Something needs to be voided. Something needs to be kind of torn from the, from the, the level of the individual. This opens up to proper scientific thinking. And mathematics would be, let's say, the prototypical tool to make that get that, that uh, rift, right? And that sounds very platonic. That's kind of uh, a, a connection that Quahé makes quite often. Uh, in that, you can see that he's a bit deep, his rationalism will be a bit different, for example, from Bachelard's uh, rationalism. It's definitely very uh, influential, a central figure in French epistemology, but weirdly enough, it's not a such a central figure for example, in Lacan's work, you don't see that many references to Bachelard in Lacan's work. Uh, what I think qualifies Poiré with this approach uh, to have become such an influential figure on Lacan, uh, or at least a, a, the reason why we should look back 
to him and understand something about him. Because, I mean, if you read Lacan's seminar, especially when he makes like his kind of big theory of discourse claims, his attempts to explain kind of why psychoanalysis appears in modernity, you can see that he uses this thing that Milner calls the theory of the break, right? Uh, the, the sort of theory of a rupture. And in that point, you can see the difference between Quahe and Bachelat. Bachelat has a theory of epistemological breaks in the plural. Quahe has a theory of one very, very big break with the birth of Galilean physics. So Quahe extracts a lot of consequences of one big break. And Bachelat and other epistemologists tend to be a bit more uh, pluralistic in the sort of uh, theory of kind of transformations in science, right? That doesn't mean that Quahe doesn't think there are, there's a theory of, let's say, more plural or pulverized breaks, but that's not really, let's say, at least in Lacan, that's not really what's kept, right? And as Milner mentions, you, this theory that, well, Galilean physics represents a certain break, this break is connected with the role of mathematics. And so mathematics is what names, in a certain sense, the rupture between the subject of science and the individual, right? Nothing, nothing in my immediate individual experience would ever, ever allow me to arrive at a proper scientific statement unless I could find this crotch in mathematics to kind of circumvent my own individuality, right? Yeah. Uh, so what happens is that Alexander Kojev, which is a much more uh, well-established figure in, in the history of Lacanian like, thinking, right? Because it was like Lacan like, calls him a master. It was this famous uh, uh, lecturer on Hegel, even before the phenomenology was translated to French. Uh, everyone went to his seminars. Uh, Quahe was friends with, with Kojev, and Kojev wrote a very influential text. I'm not sure if it was ever translated to English uh, on the role of Christianity in the appearance of modern science. Uh, as, so in which sense is Christianity is a sort of condition for the disenchantment of nature uh, and a disenchantment which is necessary for a certain break between individual and a sort of world made for the individual and this kind of displacement of the subject out of the individual, which is for him a condition for science. So Kojev gives a more existential treatment of how the subject does not coincide with the individual. And Quahe gives a more uh, kind of science-driven theory where through mathematics, this bridge or this break between individual and subject is kind of maintained, right? We know that a lot of Lacan's theory of the signifier comes from Kojev, right? This whole discussion of recognition, the role of the other and subjectivity. So when you align those two theses, you kind of get why the subject of the signifier and the subject of science would have to have some relation in so far yeah. as they both concern something of the subject which is irreducible to the individual, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of, I mean, it's still fine a bit, but that's kind of how Milner reconstructs this sort of genealogy. He's saying, Quahe tells us a story about physics where Galileo represents this sort of... Uh, break, right, where mathematics plays a role of pivot in this break with individuality uh, and an opening to a different way of thinking where the individual is no longer in, certain, in the place of being the receptor of uh, meaningful data about the world. Uh, on the other hand, you have Kojev with his discussion of the role of otherness and that kind of decentering of the subject with regard to the other. Mm -hmm. He says, well, Lacan comes after that, Lacan and Freud come after that, saying that, well, these two things are connected. That's, that would be their contribution, to realize somehow that there is an affinity between the subject of science as something which no longer is uh, in the measure of individuals, right? And the, the, the subject's relation to otherness uh, and to contingency, which is also not being the measure of individuality or the ego, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be a sort of consolidation of this core doctrine, right? As he yeah. calls it. 
I find it a bit ambiguous what this doctrine means, and I don't think it's for nothing that when Badiou is kind of interviewing Lunaire, he says, okay, what are you claiming with this doctrine? Are you telling me that Lacan held that theory of science? Or are you claiming that this is the theory of science we need to have to understand what Lacan did mm -hmm. or what psychoanalysis is? Mm -hmm. And Milner is clear saying that, well, I think that this is what Lacan believed, right? Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's relevant. So uh, just to conclude and also to consider the question here in our chat, uh, uh, I think that... Uh, a really, really big point here is that both for Kojev and for uh, Poiré, you get this idea that modernity represents this huge break, right? So uh, with sort of twisted Hegelianism of Kojev, you get the birth of modern politics, the sort of overcoming of the slave master dialectic into the sort of modern turmoil in a sort of slow decrease of history in the modern period, right? Uh, or with Quahé's more open-ended, but nevertheless very abrupt break with Galileo, both of them have this thesis of, if you track all these different uh, aspects of interest to psychoanalysis, in terms of the theory of the, why is the signifier the way it is? Or why is enjoyment such a category such a problematic category. Why is the real now a big issue? All of it kind of tracks back. All the stories are told back to modernity, which is another way of saying that without continuity with the Greeks, right? Uh, so the question was, how does... Can we... I mean, I'm not very well versed here. I think we can put it on the screen, but I don't know how. How does he reflect, so Milner, right? Reflect on what he's rethinking of the role of Newtonian physics for Lacan, it is momentous, no? In how Lacan argues that science, post-Newton, is redrawn to literally change the real. Yeah, I think that this is, again, I think this is really the big point that you want to make. I think we should be a bit, should, there are some complicated questions we should ask, two, two types of complicated questions, but if you just take it at face value, I think that you will, Milner is claiming, and I think you do find this in Lacan, this idea, look, through these little letters of mathematics, this little machine, formal machines. Is it still working, Daniel, or is it, am I? You're good. You're good. Okay, you just made yeah. a face. So, oh, no, sorry. No. This, so, <laughs> the claim is kind of like, uh, through these little symbolic apparatuses, uh, which are in constant tension with, you know, individuality, consciousness, self-apprehension, they, they follow rules which are not your own narcissistic rules. Through this, science manages to touch on something which the, the, the very handlers of science, right? The people who will both use technology and develop it and propose theorems and so on, those people are no longer commensurate with the products of science. And I mean, that claim that, look, this is a kind of Pandora's box of, box of science, uh, which was opened at a specific moment, I think it still is one of the most common place descriptions of the role of science in the world that we have in psychoanalysis. It's mm -hmm. like, I would say seven of every 10 texts that mention, you know, do some analysis of contemporary life within Lacan amongst Lacanians, look at some point claim, you know, when science is an alliance with capitalism, producing the Latusas, which are all these crazy things, technology and reinventing the subject. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in a kind of acephalous way, because it doesn't know what it's doing, things like this. So there is probably the most rigorous version of a otherwise very commonplace argument among Platonians that is made in the book. Uh, and I think that to summarize my rant, I would say that uh, the theory of the unified break of modernity is a very important claim that combining Kojev and Poiré, we can say that this break is happening simultaneously at the level of the relation to otherness from the Kojev and Hegelianist side and the relation between uh, the symbolic and the real, right? Some, somehow our discursive capacity suddenly 
side more with the real than with ourselves true mathematics yeah right i would say those are the big kind of uh mm -hmm. things being defended there but again so uh, yeah but hopefully that answers um andrew <laughs> yeah yeah no, no 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 that's good it's good so let's okay so let's let's do this um we need to talk about sasur and and how the subject of the signifier relates to the subject of science because milner will say that for lacan linguistics could be thought of under sasur's model of it and here we're talking about the first classicism the first period of lacan's thought what he calls the first classicism and he says that sasur um has a completed science and structural uh, linguistics uh completes completes it and um what's interesting about that is that he says that it, it completes it because it provides a link to a um a, a sort of logic of the unconscious which itself he says is uh coherent with extended Galileism, right? And that the notion of the unconscious being structured like a language um, is what links uh, Sassur to Coyer and the subject of science. And this is what he calls a hyperstructural conjecture, right? And that the idea of the subject of the signifier is one of a um, uh, non-qualitative non specified uh, entity uh, and so i think we should take a minute to break down this very paradoxical theory of the signifier as milner uh gives it i think there's many ways to to break it down but i wonder gabriel if we could kind of go through and maybe even some screen sharing would be helpful i know on page like 61 for example um he gives three axioms of saussure's completion of science right a theory minimalism, an object minimalism, and a property minimalism. Um, I don't know if you flagged that particular part, but I found it quite, uh, quite nice. Um, so what do you make of this? Maybe we could take a step back um, about Sassur as a completed science, at least in the early Lacan. How yeah, do you... I, mean, I, I don't know. I didn't even know. Uh, does he use that expression, complete science? Yeah, he definitely does. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I only found two references in the in the in the book. Both of them uh, not directly with regards to 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 Sosur, More in a in a kind of uh, the way of of localizing the place of mathematics. I mean, we can go back to it. I don't think it's the crucial thing. I think that the, the we can continue the story we were talking about and bring these elements you just mentioned in, right? Because where were we with this previous description of Lacan's kind of theoretical commitments, right? We said, well, Lacan would agree, according to Milner, with the idea that modernity represents a really big irreversible break that affects all areas of life in a certain way that this break uh has a kind of ternary status i'd say science mm -hmm. is, represents this break uh the, our relation to otherness at the level of kind of political life mm -hmm. social life as Kojev would say but both Kwaje and and Kojev are also saying at the religious level the level mm -hmm. of the, can we still make a reference to something otherworldly after this break? And both say, no, we cannot. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's, it's happening at the religious, scientific and kind of social level at once. Okay. So Lacan would, Milner claims Lacan agrees with this. So where is psychoanalysis in this? Since the only tool to navigate this gap that you're accepting according to Poirier is mathematics. Mm -hmm. Are we claiming therefore that is Lacan claiming that, that psychoanalysis is mathematizable? It, it can be turned into a calculus, can be treated like physics is, or something like this. And that's where Mil Milner, I think, introduces uh, Saussure. Yeah. 
uh, and introduces the thesis of extended Galileanism. Yeah. Uh, to account for this question, how can we put psychoanalysis under this heading or this trend when its relation to mathematics is not that simple or its relation to science is not that simple? And I think that uh, we need to make a sort of, I think, a very, very meaningful kind of parenthesis, which is Milner is a linguist. And he's a linguist which has a commitment that is not reducible to Lacan's commitment, meaning he was perfectly capable of realizing that the Saussurian paradigm uh, with its sort of structuralist uh, unfoldings to Jacobson, for example, that they are not the last word on science, uh, linguistics as a science. So he engaged with it, but then he engaged with Chomsky. He had uh, kind of, uh, it's not like he was fully subsumed under that. He has his own questions and he tried to develop like of a new footing for the epistemology of linguistics. So he's very much engaged with the real discipline of linguistics. Mm -hmm. uh, so when he claims that Lacan found something in structural linguistics that interests him specifically in it, right? He's aware that this is not really linguistics as such that he's talking about. Mm. Lacan found a sort of motivation and inspiration, something that would be taken out of context and used. True, in true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. He definitely makes Sassur um, his own. And he does mention that um, a very interesting political backdrop to the whole debate, because Roman Jakobsen had Stalinist connections, which Lacan wanted to distance himself from. And of course, that Stalinist backdrop within the field of modern linguistics um, was highly reliant on a certain theory of historicism and Lacan wanted to push against uh historicism in his early period which I found I found that a very interesting kind of um side yeah I, I would just separate the the question of historicism and the the fact that this book takes very seriously what he calls Stalin's theorem yeah it, yeah and I, I, what, do you, what, do you, what the hell is he talking about this really bothered me quite a lot I mean Stalin Stalin has a theorem on linguistics I mean yeah, it's very famous. I know, but like to me, it's like a lot of theorem. For, I mean, it's just a statement. But we're, this is Milner. He talks in those terms. I know, but it's ironic to me that um, Stalin, at the at this granular level of theory, would have the kind of clout to influence this serious stuff that's going on here in a certain sense. I mean, obviously, it did because the he makes reference to the fact that linguists within Stalin's um, empire and so on. Uh, it's a text called driven by it. Problems of Linguistics. That's Stalin's text. Mm -hmm. So tell yes, us, it's, tell a, us, it's a text on linguistics. Tell us, tell us a little bit about it, if you don't, if you don't mind, just a, a brief. Yeah, I mean, I, we can. I, I mean, I think we should go into it in more detail later. But just to give a general, yeah, a very brief. Very the question brief. is: When a revolution happens and we change, let's say, the mode of production, right? Soviet Russia. Will this influence language or not? Right. This language, this just another one of the superstructures that, according to Marx, would change once the base is changed, or is it more infrastructural in the sense that it will remain somehow invariant and mm -hmm. the reflexes of these changes will not affect it directly? So it was a really serious question for, I don't know, historical materialism. Uh, uh, so yeah, something to consider. I yeah. I I find it very interesting, definitely a polemic choice to bring Stalin in this way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Milner today is definitely. I mean, though you claim he's an anti-Marxist, I, I I wouldn't say that. That was too but, strong. But he is yeah, certainly but, there's certainly something there. Like we should be honest, he certainly has some. I mean, in in his polemics with Bedju, he made a point. I'll just paraphrase. He said. Um, something like Marxism has a certain element of Marxism at, at, at the sensorial level has dissipated in our time. And he's talking in the 1990s present kind of time um, such that it, it isn't what it was for us and us being Maoist militants in our youth. Yeah, but he said that to justify 
that something like what he's doing to Lacan should be done to Marx, right? That one should, one needs to prove that there is thinking True. in Marx. Like he's, he's convinced of it. Yes, I know. I uh, guess I know. But did you, did you, did you get the follow through point that Milner, in fact, um, believes that that Marx produces thought in in his definition of thought? Because I wasn't convinced. I wasn't sure about that. No, I think I think he definitely thinks that. I think that I mean we can go into this. I think that the problem is lies elsewhere, uh, and I, I, there are good anecdotes we can mention there. But let's keep just that bit of sure. politics and, and history a bit out. Well, of the it can come so in we can later. Focus can... on something which I think is just to complete the stop the narrative, which I think makes sense to continue. Which is, we saw the question. You have Quahe, you have this idea of break, you have this idea of uh, sort of tearing away of individuals and the production of something we could call a subject of science. And the subject is, is the Cartesian subject. The subject is uh, the sort of divided or uh, decentered subject because science, science statements don't have the world of individuals as a reference, right? Uh, and then the question is, uh, well, can psychoanalysis be said be included in that group of practices yeah. that live within that space of decentrement? And if the main tool to, to navigate that decentrement is mathematics, what's related? What's the relation of psychoanalysis with mathematics? And then why is structuralism and structural linguistics so crucial in that yeah. narrative? Which is that uh, for Milner, what Lacan found in Saussure was somebody who stepped back and proposed an epistemology of structure with no content. In that sense, the sort of theory of a system, which is just described by differences, uh, with absolutely no commitment to substance, no commitment to almost like I said, minimal properties, minimal objects, right? What he calls the theory of unspecified structure. Yeah. And he says, which I think is one of the, again, one of those amazing sentences, he says, the, the hyperstructural conjecture is that the theory of unspecified structures has specific properties. Yeah. So just because I'm talking about something indeterminate doesn't mean I'm not talking about it in the determinate way. Yes. Right? That's what he says. Look, Saussure is the guy who introduces this. Yes. But now, why, why is that an extension? Because that's not mathematics. Mm. Right? This structure is not quantifiable. It's not, you cannot calculate with it. You cannot predict anything. You can just, and this is like Milner's favorite term, you can literalize it. You can make it rely on operations alone. Uh, and you can kind of mess with this operational space. Yeah. With the combinatorics, which only is only founded on difference. So again, so the story was subject of science, it's a break with individual psychoanalysis comes into the picture, but doesn't really fit with the mathematized sciences. But then when Saussure appears, we say, ah, but what this guy is doing, that is relevant to us. Mm -hmm. And it's close enough to a science. I mean, serious scientists seem to be more ready to admit that linguistics is a science than they are ready to admit that psychoanalysis is. Yeah. Well, if we show ourselves to be close to linguistics by the transitive property, we will be closer to science, right? So, but then for me, one of the most symptomatic things of the book comes up. I mean, you, you guys, I mean, I know Shek likes this distinction a lot, right? Between the uh, Ptolemaic expansions of a theory and, you know, Copernican revolution or a big break. And why am I mentioning this? Because isn't it funny that he calls uh, it's a proof of how serious this theory of the one break is for these guys. Rather than saying that, you know, Lacan is part of a new type of science, you know, he, he's calling up to, to a new type of science. He says, well, we're extending Galileo's yeah, that's paradigm. Right. To yeah. include. It's kind yeah. of a Ptolemization, like, well, if we include into mathematics something mm -hmm. which no mathematician would claim is mathematics, it doesn't do anything that mathematics does, but it's literal it has doesn't require a very strong theoretical semantics like we don't need to be referring to 
concrete thing you can work with in this formal system in a way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, then if we expand it in this way, can we not include the anomaly that it's psychoanalysis into this sort of well-established scientific kind of purview, right? So this whole construction that goes from Saussure to the hyperstructure theory, it goes through two steps. The first is, look, Saussure comes up with the theory of structure, which is unspecified. It relies only on differentiation, yep. but it mimics or it comes close to mathematics. On the other side, mathematics would have these, it, it, I mean, this was kind of a big thing in France, not such a big thing elsewhere, uh, and definitely an outdated project, but there was this really big and very interesting project called the Bourbaki group, right? Yeah. It was an anonymous group of mathematicians in France who decided that mathematics lacked a rigorous foundation. So they're not part of that uh, crisis of foundations of mathematics in the 1910s, uh, Russell's paradox, paradoxes and set theory. It's not about that. Of, it's not about finding the minimal building block and building everything from it, but it's about kind of organizing everything of mathematics and giving it a more unified description of the different areas of mathematics. And these guys said, well, we, we'll do it. We'll release these books, which are called Elements of Set Theory, Elements of whatever. And we're doing it as an anonymous group. Everyone pitches in and we release these books. And they, they develop a sort of more or less common grammar. And they develop a lot of term, terminology that we use today, like surjective, bijective, injective functions, uh, this little symbol for empty set, those things, they, they kind of consolidated that way of speaking uh, or writing. And they try to kind of show that the concept of structure in mathematics is one of the kind of basic concepts. Mm -hmm. So you see, on the one hand, Saussure is giving us this theory of structure that seems, I mean, it's dealing with language and psychoanalysis deals with speech. Uh, it's it easier to make a bridge between what psychoanalysis, the object of psychoanalysis and the object of linguistics. And on the other hand, through this concept of linguistic, structural linguistics, on the other hand, mathematics seems to be coming closer because it's also interested in a concept of structure that's very broad. It's not a concept of number theory. It's not a concept of measure theory. It's not a concept of topology. It's a kind of traversal concept. You would have topological structures, algebraic structures, or whatnot. Right, so suddenly it seems like, well, isn't mathematics interested in a theory of unspecified structures as well? So look, look at the, the underlying, I mean, this is, this is something that interested me a lot. Uh, the underlying theme behind this is that the theory of unspecified structures, which is a theory in Saussure, uh, and is appearing in mathematics, it would be, let's say, the most general theory. It's more general than mathematics, in a way, right? Uh, and Lacan is saying, well, from this very, very general theory, we kind of fit into the big break, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, I, I'd say that that's a bit of the narrative that takes us there. Yeah. Yeah, he says it resolves the hypothesis of the subject of science, and it hinges on the axiom of the subject uh, that is homonymous and possibly synonymous with that of classical metaphysics. And that's actually an interesting point, which is a philosophical point, which, you know, this is another way for us to understand why Lacan turns to the Kantian transcendental after his very idiosyncratic treatment with de Saussure, precisely because um, what uh, happens here is that classical metaphysics needs to be uh, reinterrogated. And he makes this whole point about how actually Lacan went back, even back to like um, medieval philosophy, um, pre-Kantian philosophy to uh, try to formulate a new conception of the transcendental with this new um, system of differential structure that he's now working with and non-specified structure that he's now working with. And so it's an interesting way, I guess you could say, to understand Lacan's turn to philosophy in the first classicism in a certain way. Um, the fact also that um, the signifier is a non-natural object. It is a non-natural object 
that is that also has no properties, but it is an object uh, which produces action, right, within its system of representation to other signifiers. And, you know, he even there's a, there's a beautiful breakdown. A signifier only represents two. That to which it represents can only be another signifier. A signifier can only represent the subject, and the subject is only what a signifier represents to another signifier. So in that way, it's like the first classicism is, <laughs> I guess, in a way, uh, similar to what you have termed Lacanian ideology. Uh, may maybe, maybe not. I, I wonder it, it, what you think about that. But um, um, yeah, it's it's interesting though that in a way, you could you could stop there in the first classicism, and I think many people maybe would be comfortable to do so. Uh, but something happens, and Milner says it was actually May 68 that happens, um, and other dynamics, which we can discuss, that forges the necessity for Lacan to make a break with his the first classicism orientation. Um, yeah, I, I would actually just disagree with you in, in this. I mean, if you could point me to the past, I know that he mentions May 68, but- Oh yeah, the, he does. The, the, right at the beginning of the second Lacanian classicism, he mentions three instabilities, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I really, I mean, at some point, perhaps it's not, we're not gonna have time today, but since that's the case, just, just mention this, like, I think it's whoever opens this book, which I think it's absolutely kind of exceptional. We don't have any other books exactly like this uh, in like the like in commentator bibliography. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll, I think we'll realize very early that Milner, he made very, very strong choices because he has one basic commitment that he calls discursive materialism, right? So under the theory of discursive materialism, which is something he took, it's his idea. He thinks this is what Lacan is doing, but he's, it's his kind of thing. Uh, you prove thinking by finding propositions in a discourse, right? So you have this kind of network of statements in a text and you extract propositions. If there is thinking in those propositions, you will be able to extract them, use them on their own, and they'll still have effects, right? So you can see that he, almost never quotes like a paragraph. He only quotes like very short sentences or he makes up the sentences, it kind of synthesizes them out of a passage. Why am I saying this? Because he's not simply trying to prove that there's thinking in Lacan. He's trying to prove that this thinking is self-contained in the sort of conceptual development. So why am I saying this? Because when he comes to the end of a classicism and the beginning of another, when he's moving from a period of thinking to another, it's important to Milner to give imminent reasons for that development. For example, the theory of, well, Lacan needs to do things differently because he wants to seduce new students. That's not a reason of thinking for him. For him, it, so he needs to frame things in terms of there is inconsistencies in this doctrine, so it is obliged to change. it. If he's changing a doctrine because it was eternally inconsistent, that's because he's thinking. Mm. He's, we're, in, we're within the work. The work mm -hmm. had a danger of being kind of destroyed, right? So even though I know he mentions May 68, I think for yeah. Milner's project, and, and, and it's kind of weird, like the way he frames the three big inconsistencies, inconsistency due to historicism, inconsistency due to the concept of mathematics, uh, and then uh, something concerning I don't know what's third information. Well, well, the other one is is also the battle against the IPA, right? Um, which which he 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 makes the beautiful point, which is kind of um, tied into the most important element. If the most important element of the first classicism is everything we've discussed around De Sassur and the subject of the signifier and its relation to the subject of science. The most important element of the second classicism is the mathem. Yeah. And he says the mathem had an institutional function, right? Which is related to all of this narrative you said about the history of the subject of science, insofar as 
it was a way for him to forge a polemic against the IPA, against Marie Bonaparte, against Melanie Klein, and well, not necessarily against them, but around establishing Freud's relationship to um, and psychoanalysis as an institution's relationship to thought. Yeah, but that, that's where I think the reason why I'm saying all of this is because yeah. you, you can see that Milner then struggles with it because he made such an effort to tell us that he's only going through the work. He's only focusing on the work. But then how do you, I mean, this is a problem for everyone who periodizes Lacan's teaching, in my opinion. Miller's periodizations, uh, Colette Soler's periodizations, everyone. How do you, what is the cause of the movement of one thing to the other? Mm -hmm. Rarely that's as clear as the movements themselves. Everyone says there is this period, enjoyment in this way, that enjoyment in that way. Yeah, okay, you can read the text, but why, right? And it's always complicated because you cannot uh, explain these moves without going through institutional and clinical matters, like mm -hmm. extra conceptual and stuff like that. Well, but if you're stuck with this cursive materialism, with the doctrine of the signifier, you don't really have access to those references. They yeah. always seem anecdotal. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think both of us take very seriously May 68, the institutional problems, Milner quotes them, but they always remain a bit external to what he means. And I think that uh, it's a very ingenious way of saying, look, what the theory of unspecified structure, the theory of kind of coming from linguistics did for the first classicism, the math theme, which is Lacan's own invention, he's kind of bypassing linguistics and saying, no, I can come up with a theory of structure that will bring us closer to mathematics, that will bring us closer to some theory of science, right? Uh, it's ingenious to say that the first thing was not enough and you needed the math theme. But how did Lacan know it's not enough? Yeah. Like, and, and the core problem there, which I think, in my opinion, Badiou was perfectly uh, kind of on point when he said this, is that Milner doesn't want to say that there is thinking in psychoanalysis. You want to say there is thinking in Lacan. But you can only claim that the IPA problems yeah. or teaching your students are serious problems for thinking if it's psychoanalysis that is the stage of this thought. If it's Lacan's work, those things will remain extrinsic and you yeah. will have to find other motivations. Well, that that's actually that actually links back to Kojev because the whole position there is that Lacan, and this relates also to the notion of anti-philosophy, be precisely because in order to to center the mathem, and it's very interesting that the mathem it really appears in the seminars a lot, not so much in the Acree. It's sort of a supplementary device. In the seminars, it's all over. So it's very much an esoteric device, right? Um, but he makes a beautiful point, which is why did Lacan call um, his institution that he was creating upon the break from IPA a school? And he says, and this is Milner's interpretation, which I think is a very nice one. He said he did that intentionally because he wanted it to be a place where, because what happens at a school is that students learn, thought happens. It's not stagnant. It is constantly dynamic, and that's precisely what he wanted. And I don't know which school he went to, like, but okay. <laughs> Maybe okay, fine. You could say that, but you know the <laughs> point. Now you're trying to be cute. No, but no, um, I'm not cute. I, I think that's a really serious symptom. But okay. Why well, any, well, no, but I mean, do, otherwise, political parties cannot be places of thought because they're not schools. I mean, yeah. Well, okay, we okay. I we can have that debate, but let let's just finish the. <laughs> sorry, sorry. No, 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 no. We, let's finish the point. He has all of these things. He says the master, and this is a way for us to understand what Lacan means by university discourse as well, right? Because the master now only has a strict positional authority. That in the modern universe of science, as you have articulated from Coyier and all of that, in fact within the confines of Lacan's seminar room and teaching and so on, it is actually the math theme that is the master because it's introducing a calculus. It, it's pointing to some like literalization. It's, it's, it's demonstrative unto itself. It's not as if some uh, rarefied wisdom that the master possesses 
uh, that the disciple wishes to possess. It's not a Jungian theory of discipleship. So it's 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 a it's a very anti-discipleship model in a certain way. Okay, uh, look, I I know that this theme interests you a lot, so I know you're prone to take it like be optimistic about the novelty of what he's saying. Can I just ask you a preliminary question? Like, <laughs> why is the theory of unspecified structures not enough to break with mastery? Why is structural linguistics not enough to do that? I mean, just compare it. We have a lot of interesting authors in the structural linguistic uh, history. People contributed, people developed thinking. Nobody says it's just Satsu who is the master. So, I mean, why, why only with the math theme would this break with mastery happen? I mean, it could have happened before. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. think that we need, like, it's not that special, especially because. I mean, uh, I think that that I'm, this remark is very beautiful when Milner, Milner makes it, just to, to clarify, right? He says, yes. well, when Lacan gives this importance to the math theme, importance to this use of the letters and how they are combined, for example, I mean, parentheses, he says that there are only, only one math theme, which is the math theme of the logic of sexuation. Right. Nothing else. So it's a theory of one thing. Right. Uh, everything else is not a math theme. Uh, but still, it would be a theory of how you manipulate these things. That's where, let's say, thinking is happening in psychoanalysis. You're not in relation to analytic thinking because you're in relation to Lacan, but because you're in relation to them. Right. It's very nice. And he says, well, look, this displaces the model of, you know, I'm a following Bion, I'm following Anna Freud, I'm following Bonaparte. So there would be a break there and show Lacan's desire that transmission would be thought in a different way. Uh, okay, but it's so the first weird thing for me is why is the theory of structure not enough for this? How how are the why is this? Where's the problem in terms of transmission with the previous classicism? And second, which I think is more serious, the same time that he he brings this up, the math theme as a special form of transmission that bypasses sort of substantial reference to mastery, discipleship, and so yeah, on. Yeah. What, what is reality here? Like, <laughs> let's leave Nolera aside for a moment. Like, I've never seen any other math themes become canonical. People just interpret Lacan's math themes forever. Mm. Writing about the same four letters, some operators, we better know what they mean. It's interesting because the main thing that mathematics has to allow thinking to go on beyond masters is called deduction. It's the principle of consistency. I don't need to refer to an author to know if something is consistent. There is something called a proof. Of course, this is very messy. It's not like a beautiful platonic thing. It's a really complicated field. Sometimes people are not sure. There are scoundrels, people who fake proofs, all of that. But in the end of the day, there is such a thing as proof. Well, that's exactly the thing that Milner says that math themes don't have. Math themes are distinct from mathematics in that math themes cannot, nothing is deducible from them. No new proposition can be made. You can kind of hallucinate on top of it. It allows, like Plato used to say, love produces beautiful speeches, right? Math themes produce beautiful speeches. Right. Uh, so, well, if the math theme is a bit like love, in that it produces beautiful speeches. Isn't it yeah. super relationship, erotic relationship, myotic yeah. relationship? Yeah, well, I mean, he, he really says on page, you know, 88, 87, that it was not, he was not capable to fuse the three registers of the symbolic, the real and the imaginary in the first classicism. And that it was the math theme that allowed psychoanalysis to extend that linkage. So the math theme logically leads to the Borromean nodding of the RSI into the one letter of the logic of sexuation, which you mentioned. So in a How way- would, I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot, but could you explain why the math theme leads to the Borromean knot? Because he says that, um, he says, I'll just quote, he says, recall the general problem of psychoanalysis is that there is a thinking that does not meet 
the imaginary and qualitative criteria of thought, coherence, the excluded middle, discursivity, negation, etc. In short, Aristotle. This is the only condition on which the most ambitious version of the equation of subjects can be sustained, the identity between the subject of the cogito and the Freudian subject. Psychoanalysis, therefore, must construct a theory of thinking that includes, not as an unexpected extension, but as a constitutive property, a thinking that is disjoined from imaginary organizations, right? For, and then he says something interesting, which is in Freud, this theory is almost entirely negative. What is positive about it does not deserve to be called a theory. At best, it's an energetic or biological model. In Lacan, he has an ambition to create a positive theory beyond the imaginary of thought that touches on the real, page 88. So the math theme somehow allows for that to be, to be made live wire within the school of Lacan's teaching, that it becomes okay. a, so a, a, can I, can a, I tool, just a tool for that. Yeah, so look, and then, to, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, David is asking the question, the, to, to actually invert the questions. Eric is asking, okay, but what is a math theme? Oh, great, let's start at uh, the beginning, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then David asked actually before, but he asked, yeah. Yeah. Uh, then more, the more strict the math theme, the more opposites can exist and the conscious has power. And so to begin with Eric's question, I think that, uh, well, Lacan, I'm not sure, uh, Eric, if you've read any Lacan or opened his seminars and especially his writings, I disagree with you, Daniel, that Matthews are only the seminars. I mean, the- Not the, only, but may, may, a lot of them, anyways. Yeah, 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 I mean, but if you take Milner seriously and there's only the logic of sexuation as a Matthews, like Le Tourdi, that the text would be like the, the one with the Matthews, right? Uh, but you find throughout Lacan like, being a bit more relaxed with the definition of Matthew. To me, the use of formal writing, uh, where letters and the relation between them are supposed to be capturing some fundamental relation that the theory is proposing. So if you're very vague and you just open it, you would say, ah, Lacan uses some weird math, mathematics, right? Not math, the drug. Uh, if you look at it more, more carefully, you see that, first of all, mathematicians will look at that and say it's crazy, it makes no sense. Uh, so it's not mathematics, it's something slightly different. Uh, that's what he calls the math theme, right? We have the phoneme in linguistics, which is a unit, right, of phonetics, the unit of sound that makes a difference in speech. Math theme would be a unit of discourse that makes a difference in a formal system. So he explained with the phoneme, but now for mathematics, right? Mathy. So that's what he calls a mathem. This minimal formal unit uh, that plays a role in a sort of operational, formal operations. And it's kind of modeling or kind of uh, capturing some relations in a formal sense, right? I think what David meant, which is if you go back to the story we're talking about, where, well, it seems like mathematics is the way to decenter ourselves, to not think with our own heads, but think with this symbolic apparatus. And by displacing from our own limitations, we get to talk about the world in a way beyond how it appears to our senses, how it appears to us, right? Which would be science. Uh, but that's what his thesis, mathematics mobilizes us, allow us to make us this, this decenterment to, to capture the world through different lenses, right? So, but like we saw that psychoanalysis doesn't really do that job. It's not so amenable to a mathematical treatment or a scientific treatment by any clear sense of scientific experimentation. It, it's constantly, at least in the 70s, 60s, it was, there were very good texts dealing with if psychoanalysis is a science, in which sense it's not, and so on. Uh, again, a parenthesis, the classic argument is that, well, experiments in science are repeatable. And in psychoanalysis, the object is very singular. It's a singular speaking being, it's not repeatable, right? So there was a big challenge there. So we saw that psychoanalysis doesn't fit the sort of mathematical paradigm of the centerment of the subject. But we saw that with the first classicism, Lacan would borrow from Saussure a theory of structure that would allow us to come closer to 
mathematized science. There would be a problem with that, and I'm proposing that we, it's not clear what the problem is uh, from Milner's description. But then the second candidate would be Lacan's own invention of the mapping, which is this thing I was telling Eric what it is. Now, the question is, how is the mapping bringing us closer to mathematics and to mathematized science if it's leaving out some basic operations that we are allowed to uh, mobilize when dealing with mathematical formalization? Deduction, uh, not necessarily classical negation, but a ruled form of negation. It can be uh, intuitionistic negation, paraconsistent negation, but still it's a, it's a form of negation that it's not explosive and leads us to pure inconsistency, right? It allows us to say if a statement is true or false, if we, if we proved something correctly or false, and it gives us tools to develop new theorems out of previous statements. So, uh, on the one hand, this is what Milner is doing in this book by having this kind of Euclidean presentation. He's trying to derive statements from previous statements in Lacan, but it's kind of a stylish idea. It's not really like, not Lacan style, right? It's Milner style. And secondly, he's telling us that Lacan's way of bringing psychoanalysis closer to science in the second classicism is a theory that doesn't have from that doesn't keep from mathematics a lot of its uh, elements only keeps some other aspects so it separates mathematicity in the sense of capacity to calculate capacity to develop new theorems capacity to explore its own limits because mathematics also very interestingly is capable of proving things about its own consistency and its own inconsistency right it keeps something else what does it keep the idea of literalization, the idea that we are able to have a writing devoid of sense, but still closed upon itself, right? Uh, so I find it particularly interesting that the consequence, in my opinion, the practical real world consequence of the theory of the mapping is that we end up, sub because there is no deduction, because there is no theory of consistency, for the use of mapping, production of new mappings, the subject represented, the, the subject that a mapping represents to the other mappings, always Lacan. The question that is raised when I try to do anything with the mapping is not what, what one mapping means to another, what one proposition in formal language, how it relates to another. Is it true? Does it follow from it? Can it be proven starting from that other one? The only questions that are raised are, is this Lacanian? Is this what Lacan meant? Mm -hmm. Is this still within the corpus? So Lacan remains I see. the reference point. So I don't think that in practice, uh, we get what Milner is saying about the tradition. Now, 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 I, now I see what you're driving at. Yeah, because in a way, Milner portrays the second classicism in quite rosy uh, terms by saying, well, it was a very ambitious attempt to demaster himself, uh, but you're saying that, uh, by, and then by placing this instrument of the math theme in in his place, in his stead, uh, which would be a theory of a kind of peer transmission um, that would allow for a certain inventiveness of psycho psychoanalytic practice, right? And you can see that the trappings of that would be ideal for the advancement of psychoanalytic knowledge and the, the advancement of the clinic. So it's quite sound, but. Uh, but you see how, how it fits very nicely with the Quahetis as well, how it's still alive because. Yeah, yeah. If there's only one break in science, everything after that is not really that inventive. It's kind of a continuation of the biggest break ever, right? So when psychoanalysis is a bit weaker, than mm -hmm. this, weaker than mathematics, it also looks more creative. It's like always on the verge of not making sense. So it's kind of like the, the crazy uncle, the, 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 the cool uncle kind of with regards to, you know, the really kind of nerdy, hard sciences. It's more free, jazzy. And I think that's not true. 
Uh, yeah. Science is ridiculously inventive, you know? And that's also why no, I mean, you don't see that many, I mean, Kuhn doesn't have this theory, uh, Mashallah didn't have this theory, uh, you know, other, uh, I don't know, Ian Hacking doesn't have this theory. Most epistemologists don't believe or don't, don't need to think in terms of one big break. Science mm -hmm. is filled with small breaks. Mm -hmm. That's why it's filled with creativity, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the word philosophy is in the title of the, um, of the book. Uh, science and philosophy, but we haven't talked about philosophy at all. I think we should bring it up. I don't know if now is the best time, but it does emerge as a problem in the second classicism, as you'll remember. Yeah. Because Lacan has that very famous Heideggerian-esque point that, um, what is it? Politics plugs a hole uh, in the real or something like this, that politics in, in, in simple terms is... Um, out of place with science that in fact in our age science has a certain hegemony and he makes these quotes from Lacan's widely read presentation in television where um, Lacan analyzes the moon landing and he says something interesting which I didn't I missed when I read television which is that uh, nothing of the significance of the moon landing uh, would a would a would a philosopher have anything to say of significance about it? It's a purely an event of science, it's in a certain way, and therefore philosophy and politics um, are, in a way, um, relegated to a subservient place in relationship to science. And I wonder what you think about that in relationship to how Lacan um, deals with philosophers throughout his teaching and throughout his and stuff like that, you know, like, is that a way for you to understand how Lacan treats Hegel throughout, for example? Um, do you agree with Milner there on his, on the way that he portrays what philosophy is for Lacan? Okay, just just before we go into it, am I, am I correct to assume that we're probably going to go another half an hour <laughs> i think okay. it's okay yeah we're good okay. we're, just, just just so i don't, don't have yeah, to we're, we're gonna this. we're gonna go for like another half an hour um sure. it's great so let's go uh so going back to a little story if you look at the way you described this like philosophy plays a very positive role in the first classicism yep. why because look at the the propositions we had right mathematics mathematized science created the subject which is not the individual Philosophy was the first to interpret this as a subject, which is what Descartes did, right? The Cartesian subject emerges from this break, telling us that, look, this kind of weird displacement of the symbolic truth in mathematics that Galileo is proposing, this is, this, let's say, the awakening of a certain capacity, which is the subject, which is our capacity to be kind of outside of ourselves, where, where proper thinking happens. Right. So in between the Quahe thesis, the Cochet thesis, uh, there is a thesis, there's a philosophical kind of supplement, which is the Cogito. So mm -hmm. when, mm -hmm. when Lacan says the subject of science is the subject of the signifier because the extended Galileanism, because the theory of structure is a theory that is on par with, the, with science, in, it kind of extends science, but in a cohesive way. In between there, there is a philosopher saying, yeah, and in science, there is a subject. Therefore, mm -hmm. in structure, there is a subject, right? Okay, the moment that his, Lacan changes his mind, actually, this reminds me of what I wanted to say before I forgot when you mentioned the Borobian thing. When he says, forget language, structural linguistics, those got, that theory is actually not enough. Uh, it puts the math in there and says, well, but it's not about structure because that's still too symbolic. That implies a consistency we don't want to assume. Uh, we just want to say that little letters without any sense uh, exist and it, they are material they are not pure differences and this material when you handle it you're handling something that has a relation to the real that the individual doesn't have right uh when you get to this sort of theory of the material uh which is what would be let's say the theory of the mapping the mapping wouldn't be a system of differences from a block it would be small group of letters with no meaning but whose relations beyond meaning 
do capture something we couldn't capture with our individual consciousness, right? At that point, he no longer wants a philosopher to come in between and bring science together with psychoanalysis. Because, uh, in fact, the philosophical promise that this is a human capacity, that this is something that is integrated into, you know, subjectivity in, in a more uh, kind of harmonious way or whatever, that becomes a kind of problematic piece. It no longer is the founding core of a doctrine, right? So you see this shift. I mean, I'm kind of trying to, to re reproduce Milner's argument, right? He said, he, Milner says that there is a shift. He accounts for the fact that Lacan becomes much more aggressive towards philosophers because of this. He no longer needs philosophy. And then there are some pages I really dislike in the book. Like, I, I think that they're bordering on, on like, just trying to kind of wash over the problem because he goes from uh, the theory of indifference in philosophy to anti-philosophy. So yeah. there, there will be a, a radical indifference that Lacan acquires with regards to philosophy. Like, yeah, I have nothing to do with that. I don't need the philosophical thesis <laughs> of the subject because what Descartes saw in science and saying, yeah, this is the power of thinking to go beyond. That's not a power of thinking. That's actually something that is disjunct from thinking. That's mm. the real. And that will never, every time science turns its real part into a formalization that has deduction, consistency, blah, 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 it already lost something of it. And we are more radical than science. And that's where I think things become really weird because that's where we consolidate the view that we will find in seminar 17, seminar 20, and everywhere that a philosophers are naive like this coming from the guy who quoted philosophers more than freud in his seminars but now philosophy is naive because it has a theory of subjectivity based on the symbolic part of science the use of discourse the use of of formal systems not the impasses the 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 minimal material dimension of science or whatever mm. uh so it becomes, on the one hand, kind of aggressive towards science, to the point that Lacan will develop this idea that psychoanalysts need to study anti-philosophy, which became like this huge topic. But on the other hand, he will also put psychoanalysis in a kind of, you know, like just to make like a little dramatization, right? You have the individual, you have like how science creates through mathematics this gap for the subject of science. And we saw that mathematics is what allows this big gap to happen, right? Lacan is kind of trying to tell us that psychoanalysis manages to do a little less than this. Yeah. Rather than go from literalization to formalization to mathematization, it just goes to literalization. So it sticks closer to the real. Science is a bit too strong, right? It goes a bit too far. It forecloses its own inconsistencies. It creates some sort of acephalous mechanism. But psychoanalysis is the one that keeps closer to this major break opened by modernity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And well, for me, that, that's a very weird thing. Uh, especially because and that's where the Borromean thing comes in. I mean, you the way when you were to when you went to mention the Borromean thing, you did, I mean, very similar to what Milner says, suddenly we were, we were no longer speaking about how is Lacan formalizing psychoanalytic statements to the use of linguistic, structural linguistics, to the use of methods. Suddenly, we're talking about the meta theory of what literality is, what literalization is. And now the Borromean structure shows us how the latter is a product of the intersection between the real, the symbolic, and the imaginary. So we move to a meta theory of the means that psychoanalysis has to think itself. We're no longer thinking psychoanalysis. We're trying to justify. It's like we arrive at the mathing, and then a regular person says, OK, but why are you calling this mathing if it's not mathematics? Like my friend is a mathematician. He says this is bogus. Then we stop. We no longer use the mathing. We move to a higher register, and we say, ah, but there is a theory where the latter is actually kind of a pre-mathematical formalization. It's more material than mathematics. It's 
doesn't require consistency or some naive totalization and it that's why we're using it so the whole Romian thing is actually coming up as a way to account for the choices we made and it's not kind of a move in the chessboard of psychoanalysis that's the weird thing and Milner is, is okay with that because the whole book is discussing the sort of meta theory that psychoanalysis has about its own legitimacy mm. right in my opinion this is what this book is and i mean i think that this is uh the the most profound symptom of the book and i think it, it's it's amazing because it is so emblematic of it like the question we should ask is why to prove that there is thinking do we need to show the relation to science right i mean uh you you know i'm very fond of but use the theory of thinking and i think that he manages to step back and at least allow us to say that politics thinks not because it relates to science but because yeah. it relates to itself science thinks because right. it relates to itself so why is it that we to prove thinking need to relate psychoanalysis to science i see yeah right which is like a, a, a personal position that underlies the whole book yeah that's true right. yeah 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 well well that's actually why he really uh finds he, he doesn't dig into the the period from encore after he doesn't see uh and he admits at the very conclusion in the really written just probably last year uh the afterward where he says well you know arik loren wrote this book about uh what the Joycean period of Lacan, the late Lacan, the Lacan where he turns to literature and where he turns to the Synthome and things of this nature, really, in fact, proved that, well, you're not going to be happy with this, maybe, <laughs> but the Malarian effort constitutes kind of the continuation of thought in, in, in a way. Um, I don't mean to but say you're not true. happy with that, but, but I think that um, obviously in your book, you wage a, a really, really robust critique on the Malarian, on an, on an aspect of Malarian, although you obviously have a lot of um, sympathies with what they have achieved. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that, yeah, I, I think you make a nice point. Maybe for the benefit of listeners, can you say a couple things more about Alain Badiou's theory of thought? I think we've already elaborated yeah. Milner's theory of thought, and it's, very robust i mean it's all linked into um the core doctrine of science extended galileism i mean i even saw that he's written a book working within the paradigm of extended galileism to extend chomsky chomsky's theory of linguistics as well so that's his um that's his model uh, but could you say what Badju's model is yeah so uh for people interested in this i really recommend to download Badiou's seminar on Lacan and read the ninth chapter, which is Badiou discussing with Muner. So both views are presented very clearly there. Um, yeah. So to begin with, just recapitulating what Muner says, right? Uh, I would summarize it in this way. Muner will claim that uh, thinking is the mark of something impersonal inside the personal. So he's, he will say beautiful things like, Thinking is the thing that uses Kant to uh, kind of continue itself. So people are a medium. So the personal is the medium through which this impersonal thing kind of moves, right? Uh, and he says, well, when you want to show, therefore, if, if thinking is this thing that goes through the personal. If you want to show that there is thinking in a work, what you do is to show that there is uh, statements in works that survive those works. In the same way that there are statements that people make that survive their own opinions, that would be their thinking, right? Uh, so how is Badiou distinct from that? In the, in the, the, the debate that they have, 
but you will make this opposition between claiming that there is, he says, Milnera, you wanted to prove that there is thinking in Lacan, meaning Lacan is a, is a guy who proposed thoughts, uh, new thoughts, and people should read and understand his work looking for this new thinking. And he says, well, but why are you not saying that there is thought in psychoanalysis, right? Why look at Lacan's work as this sort of totality, which references to itself, breaks with itself, re-signifies re its own statements and has this sort of self-reflexive movement, right? Uh, which would be this displacements of propositions. Uh, rather than looking at the history of psychoanalysis as such, which includes Lacan, Freud and everything, but includes everyone else, includes its apparatuses, includes its debates, includes the clinic. And this whole thing is the totality which we should keep imminent to, right? Why is Badiou saying this? Because Badiou develops a theory of thinking that, unlike most of his uh, contemporaries in France and Europe at the time, was not based on the metaphor of texts. For Milner in his discursive materialism, ultimately, all there is is discursivity. Like, you know those paradoxes First year grad students love to say, like, ah, you want to talk about what's outside of language, but you need to use language to do so, therefore you're still in language. Yeah, French theorists took that seriously as like really radical thinking. So uh for Milner, well, if you want to show thinking, you need to show thinking in the movement of language, in the displacements of language. And when he says a proposition can be removed from its context, that's exactly how you know that there's thinking in language. A small fragment of language becomes kind of uh, vivified by some concatenative, con some rigor, and it's allowed to survive its own immediate formulation. But you is not committed to that. But you remains a vulgar Marxist in most sense. <laughs> it, you know, the real world is out there. Language is not primordial. Thinking can touch the real, change the real, and the real is not really the unknowable, right? So he doesn't have a theory of thought that is reliant on discourse or only uh, kind of, only has discourse as its reference. So for him, the whole movement of self-reflection includes representation, but includes what he calls presentation, what presents itself. Now, what presents itself in psychoanalysis is not what Lacan wrote presents itself in psychoanalysis is what patients say, right? So there's a different theory of thinking where we're still looking for the sort of impersonal or indifferent uh, cluster of things that can displace themselves through contexts, but we're no longer uh, kind of confined to look at this inside of language as a sort of byproduct of the use of discourse in language. So they, they, they don't agree that point, right? So this is relevant because uh, this gives us a bit of a picture of the sort of kind of cage or the sort of framework that Munner is setting up for himself. Is he first defines this kind of limits, discursive materialism, uh, and then he needs to show that there is thinking. But on the one hand, this will commit him to look at the work and not to psychoanalysis. And on the other hand, in my opinion, it requires him to have a textual theory of science. And this is, I think, ultimately what Milner and Lacan's, Milner and Lacan do with Coahé, to take him as the guy who says, science is first of all, a new textual practice, not an experimental practice, right? It's a textual thing in the sense that it's the symbolic, it's the mathematical language, which is the one taking us to a new place. So they all, the Quahé is also treated as somebody who creates a theory of science that is compatible with this discursive materialism. Mm -hmm. So there is, there is a kind of uh, uh, tendentiousness, I think, right, in this whole way of framing the debate. What I wanted to, to say, I mean, there are two things I think we should talk about. I, you, you mentioned this. One is the book ends by saying, ah, so the math theme, this new thing, 
Lacan no longer needs philosophy, he no longer needs structural linguistics to, sh to say that psychoanalysis has access uh, to something that is literal, something that is beyond sense, right? Uh, but then he says, even this is not fully consistent, and at some point Lacan will drop this in favor of a sort of Joycean wordplay. And that's what's literal in no sense. Like, poetry would go further than mathematics uh, in kind of pursuing the line of what is a letter that has no meaning. Because it's not only without meaning, it's also without consistency. It has no commitment to the consistency that mathematics would have. So you see, like, the, we turn the failure of structural linguistics to be measurable, quantifiable, consistently of, treatable as a formal system into a power. Now, that's the good thing. Right? In the doctrine of the math, in the fact that it has no consistency, no formal enchainment, now that's what's cool about it. Well, but if that's true, then forget the math thing. Go with, the po the, with poetry, because it does that much better. And with concatenation, and with a history. Right, Poetry does this sort of wordplay, changes in language, blah, 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 play with meaning, changes in meaning, because... Like, has a long history of doing this, so why not choose that path? And it seems like Lacan does, right? At the end of the book, he ends with an open assessment of that period. He says, okay, fine. He, you can see why, and he uses Wittgenstein to kind of put this on the side of a kind of, well, if Wittgenstein, the first Wittgenstein divides logical systems and logical modeling on the one hand and this mystical thing that shows itself on the other and Wittgenstein himself the, in the tractatus associates this with poetry and, and, and other uses of language right he says well this is what Lacan is doing he's leaving the logical on the one side and now he's working on this other side and he ends at that in the uh, afterward he says that he had this sort of Epiphany. He was reading Eric Lohan's book, and he says, well, Lohan is a student of Miller. Miller is a guy who developed Lacan's teaching. Well, if Miller was able to reflect upon Lacan, and this reflection produces consequences, which is Lohan's new book, which is a really good book with new thesis, therefore, Lacanian thinking continued. And I didn't see that this last phase which is the phase that Miller and Lohan are dealing with. It's actually full of thinking and keeps a relation to a new kind of... And, and, new and, importantly, and, and importantly, sorry, he also says, I think interestingly, that I neglected to... That my method could also be applied to the esoteric Lacan, in a way, or the oral yeah. Lacan, which I, I yeah, found that that. quite nice. That. I think that's quite nice, too. Uh, for yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't really see how that... I mean... I can see that, like, there's a reason why that statement comes in the afterword together with that recognition that the late Lacan of Joyce would be a consistent Lacan, new Lacan. Why? Because the Lacan of poetry, of wordplay, and more importantly, right, uh, Milner wrote extensively about hom homophony, right? The fact that in concrete use of speech, you can have something sounding like something else, right? Two things that sound the same. And in this in this in distinction, this indetermination is a concrete indetermination. He wrote a lot about this, but he used to write about what he calls the given homophony, the homophony that is, I say, a structural facts of language. He didn't write about the wordplay as a positive kind of uh, force, interventionist in the indetermination. And he says, well, this is what Joyce was talking about sort of constructive indetermination. And I didn't know that this was a consistent new period in Lacan. Right. So he says, well, the moment that I take constructive indetermination as a more, let's say, uh, legitimate uh, tool for psychoanalysis, well, then Lacan's speech and his oral uh, uh, doctrine becomes also more legitimate. Yes. So that's the connection. Yes. Uh, honestly, the thing that really kind of caught my attention in the afterward is the very quick remark that he says that, well, I wrote this book because I was in isolation. I was working alone. 
I felt like there was a problem in the reception of Lacan in the 90s. People were babbling, but there, there are no, no thinking was happening in these commentators. Uh, and I didn't care to look what was happening in the school, in the course again. If I had, I would have realized that there was thinking going on. Right. Still, right. I think the fact that he was he's talking about this distinction between isolation and collectivity as a kind of thing that he didn't realize, that's the thing that I would import into the book. Because for me, that's the reason, ultimately, why this is a book about supposedly a book about psychoanalysis, psychoanalytic thinking, and it ends up being a book about psychoanalysis relation to science. What's the only thing he keeps from science in the end? The idea that you can capture some aspects, some properties of psychoanalysis into a, for a minimally formalized thing, and this is guaranteed to circulate. Yeah. Science is not about, uh, it's, it's vouching both for, let's say, a sort of public legitimacy, like, well, if you have some relation to science, then we're thinking. But at the same time, more in a more operational sense, it's vouching for the fact that analytic ideas will circulate no matter how crappy our institutions are. So we don't need to question ourselves how organizations should be uh, structured in the analytic community, because if we're doing things that are scientific, proto-scientific, more than scientific, ultimately ideas will circulate because they're going to be transmitted, because we're beyond sense, and sense is the thing that it really is the obstacle to proper transmission. So I think that science here is sometimes the standing for this well, difficulty of having a proper analytic idea of, of thinking, which concerns psychoanalysis itself. And on the other hand, sometimes the standing for the fact that our criteria for how to verify analytic statements is also lacking. We don't know how to verify the statements, how to make them circulate. We mm -hmm. still need big authors that publish books every now and then, and they tell us what we're going to study for the next year in our schools. We need to refer to the masters, which are the same masters for 50 years. Right. Develop are always small and they're always prompted by the times that are changing, never because anyone had a good idea, right? So uh, I think that's interesting that in the end, he brings up this thing about working in isolation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, because it's- I thing that I know I'm speaking a yeah. lot, but just because I think that I'm, I'm kind of saying a lot of crappy things about the book or questioning a lot of it. But I think that we really, really, really shouldn't let one fundamental thing about it passed by in silence, which is, have you ever seen another book that claims that Lacan is a crystal clear author? Like, he's not, he bypasses all problems of interpretation. Like, he, he yeah. proposes, he invites people to discuss Lacan as if we understand Lacan. Like, yeah, well, there, there, how to understand Lacan. I no, think no, that he, that's... He, well, he doesn't say that Lacan is crystal clear. He says there is there is a core of clarity within Lacan if we know how to find it. And, and, and he gives the means by which to do so. Uh, and it's in his writings. Uh, but, but I think the other point is that actually it's also in. So it's the third sentence of the book, man. Lacan is, as he said himself, a crystal clear author. Author, author, writer. Yeah. But I know, I know, but like his point is that he doesn't touch the esoterics point. And that's why I personally found that at the end, when he says, well, Laurent and these other figures in the literary period of the Joycean period, maybe, you know, um, there's much more to be done there. And so anyways, but I do want to recognize time and also these several interesting questions. So um, uh, EJ says it'd be interesting when Paul Livingston thinks about Milner because he's a Carnap and uh, Wittgenstein scholar. I think he has a text on Milner. Not, not all Milner, but it quotes Milner extensively. The one, a very old one, let me see if we can find it, uh, on the, what, what, how is it called? Uh, it's one that has the, the discussion of mathematics and formalism and like, uh, I, 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 shit, I forgot the name of it. It concerns, the logic of sexuation as well. 
but he, he discussed him there. Like he's definitely aware of him. Okay. Great reference. So then Maceo Mori says, what if we could introduce a Foucauldian modality in the sense of looking at science in what he calls a new epistemological soil in a sense, what if we could point to a, a triad of paganism, Greeks as mediator, Christianity as a start of a form of negation of myth and science, postmortem of God and absolute rejection of negation, pure positivization, false positive in parallel in psychoanalysis had to pass into its beginning in another parallel triad, Freud, psychoanalytical dogma in the form of science, Jung, mysticism, and then gross revolutionary despair and catastrophe. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, so uh yeah, yeah. I, I, my question is if Marcel can 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 uh talk a bit about a bit more about it like what would this do like because this is something I, I think we should mention uh like there's a bit of a distinction in my opinion between that's why I said at the beginning like how should we understand this book is it giving us the theory that Lacan head of science. This is how Lacan thinks psychoanalysis fits with regard to science. This is how his commitments, and this will help us understand his choices. Or is this a theory of science that will help us understand psychoanalysis, like a, a better theory of science, which now tells us something new about psychoanalysis? I think it's more the former. It's like he's trying to tell us most of the time how Lacan thought about science and about philosophy, right? Now, there are two other options, in my opinion. Uh, one is to say, okay, well, scientists are not very convinced. Like, as I think David said, right, uh, science rejects psychoanalysis, and that's sad. Well, sad for whom? Uh, it's sad for Lacanians or psychoanalysts most of the time, because apparently we really wanted to be considered a science for some reason. Apparently, we're not happy being, you know, put side by side with uh massage therapists and people who do reiki and other <laughs> things like that we should be more serious than that after all we, we read french and uh and and joyce uh, <laughs> so my, my point is like for example when i read Masao's comment the thing that comes to mind is this sort of re retort that like you guys think this is not science but if you really understood what science is and you had a genealogy of scientific practices, you would have better tools to see where psychoanalysis really fits, right? Which is a bit what Milner is doing. I mean, he, he's also saying, well, guys, science is actually born of this rupture. Well, if you take this seriously, you will see the psychoanalysis is very much connected to that rupture, right? Uh, in my opinion, if you look at this, if you squint a little, this argument looks like a sort of justification. Psychoanalysis remains the same. Scientific practice remains the same, but a certain unease with their misencounter is alleviated because we can actually be friends. If you just allow us to be smarter than scientists, uh, but at the same time to be like close friends, it's different from making arguments that will help psychoanalysis to move further. For example, I mean, of course, there are thousands of problems with all sorts of practices connected to you know scientific status but the deal with subjectivity like really crappy psychological doctrines uh you know psychiatric uh you know smart asses and and really kind of criminal sort of views of pseudoscience in these fields surely like you can just you can't tr trust science at face value but at the same time i mean there is the option to just look at the good practices of science and say, okay, what is going on here? Can we say that the same thing is going on in psychoanalysis? By, but I mean, and even doing the refined version of that, which is saying, I totally realize, recognize that these are working in different fields. Like physics is working with, you know, experiments on, I don't know, properties of matter through specific sort of uh, questions and focusing on different objects in psychoanalysis is. So it's not like we're going to import like by analogy 
practices from science to psychoanalysis. But science does teach us what is possible in terms of rigor, transmission, and so on. Why not measure up to the real practices of scientists rather than you know, try to convince them that we are already on their side precisely because of our failings? Like, that's, that's the thing that I, I think sounds a bit like a cop-up. Like, uh, it's kind of an easy way out. And I think that even though for me, as I said, there is a profound benefit and I think it's very underexploited. Like we, we don't have the, the culture um, as Lacanians to do this, of saying this thing that I understood of Lacan, this is what Lacan is saying. Like there is no more profound statement to be found if I just read a bit more, if I just read the unpublished seminar, if I just read the essay by La Menet that he quoted because in an unpublished version, like I think that in a certain sense, though, uh, I, I mean, Milner is clearly uh, favorable to the call for the end. He he he, cha he praises Miller's editing of the seminars. It's not like a resented Lacanian who is kind of cast aside from his prose. But at the same time. Uh, he does choose to show us that we are authorized to claim to understand Lacan only with the things that are available to us and not the monopoly of a chosen few. The written works don't require you to have access to the published seminars, don't require you to go into an infinite web of references. You're allowed to claim that this is okay, this is a work, I can work with this, right? Uh, this is also why I think that the title, unfortunately, is not my favorite translation. Like, In Search of Clarity makes it look like clarity is at the end of Milner's voyage. It's right. Looking. It's the inverse. It's the axiom. He's saying it's more Hansier like than it looks. It's more like everyone is equal. Like You can take this thing and you have what you need to understand it. Perhaps he gives you like a novel method with this idea about propositions taken out of context. This is his way of going about it. Mm. But the clarity is axiomatic. Like the work is clear, it's there. You don't need, like the one that works without masters is Milner in that sense, not Lacan or Lacan yeah. in general. So I think that the, that needs to be cherished probably more mm. discussed as a method. And we should recognize how uh, rare it is that works dealing with Lacan manage to assume that position because we're usually kind of forced into a false humbleness position where claiming that we are trying to interpret this enigmatic master in a work that will never be done. There's always a new seminar, a new commentator. A new... It's actually a way of never being done with Lacan. Like if people either, you're, you're left with a false and terrible choice of either I abandon and I and become anti-Lacan and indifferent to Lacan, or I'm stuck forever interpreting Lacan. And I think that what Milner proposes with this book, even though I think that there are all these subtleties about how he goes about it, his presuppositions, blah, 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 blah. Ultimately, behind all of that, there is a very strong kind of suggestion of how to take this, this author for its work, meaning a certain close totality, right? Uh, yeah. It's quite novel in the Lacanian. Uh, yeah, although although yeah, he does make the point that Lacan understood the greatness of certain philosophical projects, like he says Lucretius and even Marx. He said Marx is Marx is has thought in part because capital was an unfinished project, and that the that 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 there needs to be some kind of um, non non to, non totality as a part of a project of, of thought. So, I mean, is it, is it the, the case that the later Lacan is this kind of um, masturbatory sort of uh, thing where we're sort of mesmerized by the obscurity of his references that he brings to bear in that period of his time? It may be a touch of that, but it may also be a new device like the math theme, if we take Milner's contention, uh, argument, which is that the math theme was 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 a device for 
uh, the Ecole Freudienne. It was a device for his. It was a device for his school, right? It was a device for thought. It was a device to expand a certain community of analysts and to grow their effectiveness and things like that. So you have to have something that will do that, right? You you know and um, but then but then your thesis in your book Desire of Psychoanalysis comes comes home, which is uh, like, yeah, maybe there, there still is a deficit in what Lacanians can think today. Um, although now I wish, I wish that Arika Lorenz book on biopolitics was available to us in English. I think there are excerpts of it, by the way. Uh, this is the one that Milner praises as an example. Um, anyways, we are past time, my friends. I, uh, Sorry, Maceo, uh, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I don't. If you read the book, Foucault is treated, and the whole Foucauldian um, episteme is, is is some of these things are dealt with there. Could you do that to? I mean, I think you could make that wager. I'm more interested in how uh, I do. I can suggest, Masao, There is this one book that you might be interested in, which is uh, Christian Dunker's book called The Constitution of the Clinic. It's a, it's a Foucaultian genealogy of analytic clinic. Cool. It was published by Karnak Books. So I'm not, I mean, it's, it, the book was prompted by the question, could one do a Foucaultian genealogy of Lacanian psychoanalysis? And he says, okay, I'll do it. So uh, it might be of interest because he definitely goes through exactly this sort of discussion that Masao is proposing. So. Cool. Ah, you know it, of oh, you know about it. All right. Okay, my friends, this has been, I want to thank Gabriel for all of these just really great insights and for helping us put this book, raise this book, uh, visibility and awareness to people. Everyone needs to encounter this book and read it. Um, it's quite, it's quite good. Uh, and I think this conversation has been really enjoyable. So let's do really it again. Well. Let's do it again. I'm, I'm dying already to, we should do it every week. <laughs> I'd love we, you for that. We, we should do it a lot more. And uh, thank you all for, for listening in. It was, it was delightful. Great, guys. See you next time. Okay. Bye-bye.